But what's amazing is that this works at all, ever. That's the really fascinating thing. So it, in these really amazing, like really rather shocking graphs, and what we can see here is, is that as we have more compute and we train larger and larger models, we find this pretty consistent power law that will predict the final performance we will see from these models given the amount of compute we have available. This is pretty amazing. I found this really rather surprising that this was not at all obvious at the time. And I still, to this day, I think people do not realize how important, how fascinating this is that you have these and just purely empirical, these like, there's some attempt at theoretical explanation, but ultimately empirical that, uh, you know, observation that as we have bigger models and we give them more compute, they just keep getting better. This means that as models, models become bigger, they actually become more sample efficient. This is kind of crazy. Like I remember when I was taught neural networks, you know, back in the day, I was still taught that, you know, you have to be very careful to use the smallest model possible so that it doesn't overfit your data. But that just seems to be wrong. It just learns things so much more efficiently as the models get larger. A good friend of mine, Leo Gao, put this pretty elegantly in his blog. The thing about GPT-3 that makes it so important is that it provides evidence that as long as we keep increasing the model size, we can keep driving down the loss, possibly right up until it hits the Shannon entropy of text. No need for clever architectures or complex handcrafted heuristics. Just by scaling it up, we can get a better language model and a better language model entails a better world model. This is really hits it on the head why I think the scaling laws are the more interesting part of the GPT-3 paper. If they hit Shannon entropy, that means they perfectly predict everything as well as possible. So they're already a perfect method and know everything there is to know. So far, if we had more computing power, we would predict that models would just continue to get better. No new insights needed, just more computing power, which is kind of yeah, it's kind of weird. And it's, it's, it goes very much against a lot of the intuitions that a lot of people in this field have. And you thought this only worked for language? Surprise, it also works for other things. Images, you know, text image, video, math. Here from a follow-up paper here, we can see that you find scaling laws in all of these different tasks. As you just make bigger models and you just put in more compute, you get a bet you get a better model with with very predictable levels of com uh, of performance. This is crazy. This is this is astounding. To me, this is a fascinating empirical scientific discovery. I did not predict this. I did not predict that there would be these scaling laws that we could just, you know, see a power law of performance for all of these very different tasks. But here we are. And I think this is something that is worth exploring. What does this mean? You know, how, how, you know, what can we derive from this? How far can these scaling laws really take us? So uh, I think it's really important to push harder on research because I think there's a lot to do. But then on scale, yeah, scale is really good. Like, you know, when we have built the Dyson sphere around the sun and gotten compute as efficiently as we've gotten it, we can finally say, okay, like, you know, I'm very willing to entertain the discussion then that we should stop scaling. Um, but, but short of that, I, I think there's like, there's no reason that I see right now to not keep pushing really hard on it. By 2032, I don't think you'll know you're talking to a model and not a human. I mean, you might, because it'll just be like so much better than any human at helping you out with stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that by 20, I mean, that's a long time at the rate this field is going. I think it'll, mm -hmm. uh, I think it will be remarkable and it will, it, yeah, it'll feel like you're just not only talking to your smartest friend, but like thousands of smart friends that are domain experts everywhere you want that are like working at superhuman speed to do whatever you need. Mm -hmm. Like full, full, like comprehension of, of language. This technology is going to be so influential on the shape of the future that it has to be uh, a society at large participating in a very large conversation about uh, you know, what it is we, we expect the technology to do, like what things should we encourage and what things should we discourage. And I think you need to have both halves of the conversation. Like there's unalloyed good that these uh, pieces of technology can do that will make everyone's life uh, better. Uh, and so, you know, what, what I would hope is we can have a conversation, uh, you know, and it's, it's, 
government, it's academia, it's industry, it's uh, yeah, like we we need everyone to get themselves slightly better educated about what the technology itself is capable of so that you know you know your mom and mine and like whomever else wants to have a say in how their future unfolds uh can participate in this conversation and make smart decisions about you know who they're choosing to represent their voice um but like i i hope that can be a really rich conversation that balances both the positive and the and the negative that uh that that we need to be thinking about this i agree with everything kevin said about the need to get the world's input and that this principle that i hold dear is that the people that are going to be most impacted by technology deserve the most voice in how it's used and in this case i think everyone's going to be impacted and it does need to be a a real global conversation um but how we get everybody to listen to that voice, I don't, I don't know. I hope they do. I've been uh, talking about the need for 1000x more compute or 1000x you know, performance per watt improvement uh, for a little while. Um, in fact, I think it, uh, I talked about it in my hot chips keynote. Uh, and uh, and a few other events as well. The reason is the the demand for that compute already exists today, right? You know, just taking a concrete example of if I want to train one of the interesting neural nets in real time, not in you know minutes, hours, days, right? In real time, the need for that is there today. The demand for it is there today. So in many ways, we got to figure out as a technology industry, and that's the fun of being here, like how do we get there, right? So the Zeta scale is a you know, kind of a nice numerical way to say it because we have been talking you know, 10, 10 power 18 with exascale, you know, kind of the 10 power 21. But the essence of uh, the Zeta scale initiative is the thousand X to me than kind of the current performance per watt baseline. The amount of time it took from, you know, each generation from, you know, the, from Terra to Peta, Peta to uh, Exa, right? Uh, and the timeline we set from Exa to Zeta is actually shorter than the previous transitions. Historically, uh, and this is one of the foundations of Moore's law, was integration with the integration we draw this and uh, you know extraordinary kind of you know uh, things where now you have a supercomputer in your pocket uh, uh, in, a, in a phone right um, no no reason that aspect of Moore's law needs to stop because there's still an opportunity just even beyond transistor stuff just the integration aspect integration driving um, some order of magnitude efficiencies.